Hello there and welcome to the Q&A show. My name is Cyrus and for the next one hour, we're here to answer your questions. So if you've got any questions about the Bible, scripture, biblical science, creation science, or anything along those lines, then please do write to us. And tonight to answer your questions, we've got Dr. Grady McMurtry. How are you doing, Dr. Grady? Good to see you. Good to see you too, sir. Excellent. Now, Grady, I hear you've had some very uh, difficult weather in your uh, in your regions in Florida and had some power cuts recently. So God willing, everything will be fine tonight. Tell us, give us a little insight. Yeah. How are things your end? Well, uh, it's that time of the year. So that, as we say, uh, thunderstorms in the summer rainy season has started. I can hear thunder out the window right now. <laughs> I have to say it's raining in Spain as well, so you're not on your own there, Grady. So uh, if we do have any technical difficulties, but, we'll call you back. But we'll be fine, Grady. We'll be fine. But but is it raining on the plane? It stays on the plane when you come to Spain. <laughs> you have seen my fair lady. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Um, now, Dr. Grady. So this is our this is our uh, insight into our viewers. For any of our new viewers, because Grady, we're so happy we're, we're on Freeview uh, Channel 281 and we're always getting new viewers on that channel tuning in to us every month. We got in the region of about 60 to 70,000 viewers every month just on that one platform and that seems to be increasing every month. So for any viewers who is the first time watching Christian TV or maybe the Q&A show, just give our viewers an insight into yourself, please. Well, first of all, congratulations on the new platform. Thank you. I, when I was with you, when I was with you previously there, I know you were working on that. Yes. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm Dr. Gray McMurtry. I was born and raised in an evolutionary believing home. I uh, actually attended school uh, when I was a child in Berkeley, California. And you can't get out of Berkeley without being an evolutionist. I would go on to earn my science degrees as an evolutionist. Uh, I would believe it. I would teach it until the age of 27. But at the age of 27, I did what every good scientist ought to do, and that is in a search for truth, I became a Christian. Uh, I did that when I found out that truth is not a concept. Truth is a person. And if you take a look at John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the truth. And the truth is a person. And I invited that person into my life, uh, became a Christian, but that made me a saved evolutionist. And so I spent 16 months looking at science afresh and anew to determine whether God had used an evolutionary process to arrive at the creation we see today, or was what I had learned and taught others false and that God had really spoken it all into existence, whole and complete 6,000 years ago. After 16 months, I came to the realization that there's no science to support evolution at all. It's a religion, it's a philosophy, um, it's a house of cards. Basically, it's a fairy tale for adults. And so at that point, I became a biblical scientific creationist, someone who believes 100% from the Bible, and 100% from science, the creation is true and occurred about 6,000 years ago, consistent with what the Bible says. But I could believe it today from a pure scientific standpoint, whether the Bible said it or not. And then I went out and started teaching, and I've been teaching about it for the last 48 years as a teaching missionary around the world. Amazing, fantastic, thank you so much. For any of the viewers, Grady, who are watching you on for the first time on the Q&A show, what sorts of questions do we normally cover on this program? Oh, goodness gracious. We've covered, I think, about everything. <laughs> Even a few personal things that we really didn't know the answer to, but we did ask everybody to pray about. Yeah. <laughs> but everything from verses of the Bible uh, and from science, uh, I would point out the only thing that I don't talk about or answer questions on is eschatology. So if you're going to deal with eschatology, please send your Questions to Cyrus and not me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we've got a topic for tonight. This tonight's topic, um, it's one about the youth and the young people. And it's kind of, I saw this topic on Christian Today and it kind of um, concerned me as well. And I'd just love to share this with the viewers. And this is a topic. It says, suicide rates amongst young people 
is more than ever before. The opposition party to the United Kingdom government want to reverse the rise in the number of deaths from suicide as part of a health plan to replace pain and anxiety with the hope of a renewed NHS. Their plans would be to reform the NHS and will focus on the biggest causes of death in the United Kingdom, which is suicide amongst the youth. Coroner's statistics show that deaths from suicide has been rising since 2008 and has reached a record high last year in England and Wales. Suicide is the biggest killer of young lives in this country as these statistics should haunt us. The rate is growing up and mission must be and will be to get it down, said the leader of the opposition party for the United Kingdom. Now, we always talk about mental health. We talk about serious, severe mental health amongst the young people. We talk about depression, but we know greatly as a consequence of mental health and depression, it can lead to people having suicidal thoughts and even committing, wanting to commit suicide as well. I mean, it's, it's a very serious, serious topic. What are your initial um, thoughts on this story, please? Well, first of all, remember that I'm a citizen of the United States and not of the UK. Yeah. I am, however, rather familiar with the NHS for many of my friends in England who have had to deal with it. And the whole thing starts with false premises. The first false premise is that a politician could promise you something good and actually deliver on it. The second false premise is that the NHS would know how to make itself better, and it doesn't. Uh, if it knew how to make itself better, it would already have done it. But there's another false premise. I could solve the problem of suicide uh, in the UK literally in a matter of a year if you would let me handle the problem. And what I would do is this. The NHS will never come up with a program that will lower suicide with the youth until the government stops teaching evolution in the schools. It is the teaching of evolution that is the foundation of every form of evil to start with. And in particular, I would quote to you Romans chapter 1. Paul writes, he says, that evolution is the foundation of various social ills. In his list in Romans chapter 1, as you go down into the middle of his list of the consequences of the teaching of evolution, he says, those who believe in evolution become murderers. Now, the use of the word murder here is in all forms, meaning it would cover abortion, euthanasia, homicide, suicide. The word suicide is simply murder of self. Evolution is a religion, and it is a religion of hopelessness. Evolution teaches that we are nothing but thinking animals, that there is no purpose in life. And if you teach somebody that there's no purpose in life, the ones who commit suicide have simply figured it out. If there's no purpose in life, there's no reason to stick around. And so it's the foundation of a belief and a teaching of evolution in the public schools and the private schools as well that then causes young people to commit suicide at ever-increasing rates. And you will never deal with the problem. You will never lower the numbers. I don't care what program they come up with. Mm. You will never do that until we stop teaching evolution in the school. This is really a consequence of taking the Bible out of our schools, isn't it? And removing our children from having those foundations, those biblical foundations, when they're growing up from a young age, because we see mental health, mental illness as well. It's something that is so well known now and a lot more people are talking about it, which is great, but so many people are going through it. Um, from a biblical perspective and a scriptural perspective, what hope can you give to anyone watching us tonight, Grady, who may be going through a difficult time in their life? What, can, what advice can you give them tonight, please? Well, for my background, of course, I'm a biblical scientific creationist. Today I teach on the truth of creation, both scientifically and biblically as opposed to being a teacher of evolution at one time. Again, evolution teaches there's no purpose in life. There's no laws, rules, roles, standards of contact, no purpose. And that is what causes depression. That is what causes people to become despondent. 
first of all, you have to understand that's where it comes from. The second thing you have to do is understand that you are not merely a thinking animal, that you are actually, and I will quote the Bible here in Ephesians chapter 2, you are a masterpiece of God created by him, that you have purpose, and that there are laws and rules that benefit you. Amen. And that you can restore in your life, just as at one time King David wrote about, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That if you will learn to allow Jesus Christ, who is truth, to come into your life and replace the false science of evolution, the false concepts, philosophy of the world, and realize that you can have fellowship with God, you can have the love of God in your heart, you can have the love of fellow believers with you, and you can crawl out of that pit, and you can have a very useful, purposeful life the rest of your life until God, God calls you home to heaven. And I just want to say, um, I just want to pray for our viewers right now as well. If you're going for a difficult time in your own life, um, maybe you're going through a darkness, maybe you're not sure which way to turn, maybe you're going through a financial problem, maybe a big bill has come in and you don't know how you're going to pay it. Maybe you're going through a health situation. Maybe you're going through a relationship problem with your marriage or your, your partner or you're going with your children. I just pray in Jesus' mighty name that you will have peace in your life, that you will be able to overcome anything if you just reach out to Jesus Christ. Give your life over to him, give your heart over to him. He will deal with your problem. He will deal with the situation. He'll give you that light in that darkness. There is no problem that is too big that our Lord Heavenly Father cannot help and deal with. And there, is, there should be no way that there is an excuse for anyone to consider taking their own lives to be in such a dark, dark time. I understand it's easy for people to sit here and talk about everything will be all right. We all understand it's a difficult time. But reach out to God. Seek God. Seek Jesus. See how he'll, he'll reveal himself to you if you are going through a difficult time and share that with us and tell us how you're getting on as well. And if you are going through a difficult time, maybe tell us about it and we can pray for you tonight. This is a special program and we can pray with you and we can also answer all your questions. Grady, do you have any final thoughts on this particular topic? Well, again, I simply stress that, that your life does have purpose. You were created in the image of God. And, and God tells us that it is a sin to kill something made in the image of God. And so you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to ask God into your life, realize you're made in his image, and that you can have fellowship with him and the love of God in your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Grady. Uh, the questions are coming in, Grady. This one's from Albert in Perth in Scotland. And he's written, Dear Cyrus and Grady, greetings to you both. Dr. Grady, thank you for your constant guidance on so many things, not least the DVD on choosing the Bible study. Uh, my choice has been uh, my choice has been the New American Standard Bible version, and I'm very happy with it. Would you give me your opinion on the new 2020 update if you have seen and examined it? I must confess my disappointment with it, and I will be staying with my NASB. That's an, um, the New American Standard Bible version as well. That's from Albert. So have you seen the new updated version? I have just run across it. Um, I'm sticking with the one just before that. There's one a few years ago that's the one I'm working with. Okay, this next one here is no name on this one. What are the things to render to Caesar and the things to render to God? Well, it's really quite simple if you think about it. When Jesus was talking, he was talking, first of all, about the coinage, but he's also talking about the tax. And he was saying, you know, there's earthly government. And we're to pray for the earthly government, regardless of who it is. And we're to obey their laws, and we're to pay their taxes, and, and be productive, lawful citizens. Unless it breaks the law of God. So the law of God is higher, but we are to render unto Caesar as long as it doesn't contradict with the law of God. But we're also to render unto God. So when we start talking about the fact that, of course, we're to give back to God some of that which he's given to us in recognition and to provide the money that would help operate the church, missions, uh, benevolence around the world. 
And that there are really two kingdoms. There's that earthly kingdom of earthly rulers. There's the heavenly kingdom of God. And we will give unto Caesar what is reasonable, which doesn't contradict human law. Uh, it doesn't conflict with the human law versus the heavenly law. And we're still to obey the heavenly law and to recognize the king of the universe, our Lord and Savior, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This next one's from Dave to say hi to you both. I watched a documentary on Nikola Tesla. If you type it into Google Earth, the speed of light, it, see, it zooms in on a great pyramid of Giza, uh, which is the exact line of the equator. It also aligned with true north. The three pyramids are perfectly aligned with Orion. He claims that they were power sources and could transmit electric without the need of wires. What is your opinion on this, please, Dr. Grady? Well, Nikola Tesla was a phenomenal inventor, had many interesting developments and patents. And of course, he's the one who actually won the current war, as it's referred to, with alternating versus direct. However, he also had certain problems in his life, uh, some of them mental. And uh, while there's no question about the alignment of the pyramids, that's simply because the Egyptians made sure that they did align. They were excellent surveyors, excellent astronomers, but they don't generate power in and of themselves. Okay, this next one here is, uh, let's see, uh, Grady, this one is uh, from Dave and he's, uh, sorry, Francis. Uh, hello, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. Where does the sun get its power, and how long do you think it will last? Well, first of all, evolutionists will tell you, of course, the sun came into existence millions and millions of years ago, and that supposedly it's going to you know, burn out in a billion years. This is not true. Secondly, they will tell you that um, it's on fire. They're saying it's burning hydrogen into helium, and uh, of course, we see the heat and light that's radiated from that. However, that's really not what's happening. Um, there is a small nuclear furnace inside the sun. That's true. However, we can prove that that is not really the source of the heat and light. The fact of the matter is that most of the heat and light comes from what is called gravitational contraction, meaning that the sun is a big ball of gas with tremendous gravity. After all, 98% of the gravitational force in the solar system is concentrated in the sun. It's a big ball of gas, 860,000 miles across. And because that gravity is pulling the gas towards the center, as you compress the gas, it gives off heat and light. And so most of what we're getting is from the gravitational contraction. I know it looks like it's on fire. It's got the color of being on fire. But really, it's mostly gravitational contraction with, in addition, a, a small nuclear furnace on the inside. This one's from Yuri. He's saying, uh, good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. If God made Jew Jewish people first, why are Hindus the first known religion? Well, Hinduism is not the first known religion. You know, every nationality, every uh, philosophy, um, I would say almost every business, but of course that's obviously not true, wants to claim that they're better than another. Now, how do you do that? You claim a past, um, for instance, the Egyptians claimed they had astronomical records going back 100,000 years. Uh, the Babylonians said that they had astronomical records going back 700,000 years. But the Babylonian Empire only lasted about 60 years. Obviously, that wasn't true. It wasn't true about the Egyptians either. But the Hindus are not the first religion. You know, the first religion came through the flood with Noah off the ark and was perpetrated through what's called in the Bible the chosen people. But people who did not want to accept that religion and wanted to have one of their own came up with various ideas and spread across the earth after the Tower of Babel experience, including those in India. And we know where they came from, but they came up with their own religions. Now, they can claim all the age they want to for it, but it does not make them the oldest religion. 
Grady, can you give us an insight into the situation that's going on at the moment between uh, Ukraine and in Russia? What do you make out of the recent developments that's going on there? And uh, what do you make out of Zelensky, President Zelensky, the president of Ukraine as well, meeting with all the, uh, the G7 leaders um, around the world? Uh, what is the current situation from your perspective, please? Well, I have said this before in the program, uh, going back to when I got out of uh, Russia just before the invasion of Ukraine. There's no such thing as black and white in war. You know, uh, there's, there was wrong on both sides. The, the Ukrainians had been fighting a guerrilla war in the east, which is the Russian ethnic area of Ukraine. But again, the Russians were also misbehaving and Putin was simply using this as an excuse to grab land and grab people. We've got to understand the basics of the war. Um, Zelensky's case of quite interesting. Uh, he started life off as a, a dirty comedian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not so sure that he still isn't a little bit that way, but, but the thing that's interesting is he got elected as president of Ukraine before the war. And he has uh, remarkably stood up as a resilient leader of the Ukrainians against the Russians, in mm -hmm. spite of all his many faults. If the West continues to back him, uh, he is successfully waging a small war, and I say that compared to a world war, be successful against the Russians. And now he's going to get F-16s uh, from not the United States directly, but indirectly. Yeah. Um, and along with various other weapons. And the Ukrainians have uh, shown that they are ingenious. I mean, you know, every people has very smart people in the population. They have found out how to use our Patriot missiles, which are to be used against uh, missiles coming in. They figured out how to shoot planes now with them. And uh, the uh, Russians lost a significant number of aircraft just the other day <laughs> to an American Patriot anti-missile missiles. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the bad news is that Russia has the resources to beat Ukrainians to a pulp. The bad, bad news for the Russians is they've tried to do it and got a bloody nose. How do you, uh, can you see this war escalating beyond just Ukraine? Can you see the, 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 the other major countries involved getting involved at any stage? Well, you know, China is back in Russia. There's no question about it. Uh, President Xi expected a whole lot more out of Putin than he's getting. And he, he's realizing that Putin is not nearly as strong as he appeared to be before the invasion. Uh, so China is supplying a lot of materials and they're, they're selling things to the Russians. Uh, they are buying their dirty oil, uh, trying to prop them up as best they can. Now in terms of the other nations, uh, we have, of course, seen an alliance, uh, which is called the BRICS Alliance of communist countries. And so it really depends on factors that you and I are not capable of fully understanding. I would say at the moment, it doesn't look like the other nations are going to participate in a great way. But to prophetically say that there isn't or is going to be a, a third world war is beyond my capabilities. Very interesting. Thank you so much for that, Grady. Tony's written in to say, uh, good evening to you both. So it's thunder in Florida, rain in Spain, but sunny here in England. Now that's got to be a first. There you go. <laughs> it's true. Maybe not the first, but it's unique. It is unique indeed, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, this one's uh, saying good evening to you both. Looking forward to the Q&A show. Uh, it's so informative. My question is how to coincide with envious co-workers whose intention is to cause conflict and confusion. What do you think? Well, of course, it's hard to know the details of that situation, but obviously you're dealing with typical human actions. Number one, we're to, to greet people in, in love, but we're not to argue with a fool either. And so we have to have a good response. We're to try to do this in love, correcting them. But I don't know the exact situation that you're dealing with. So it's hard to give you a specific answer versus just a general one. 
Well, they're saying is to co coincide with envious co-workers whose intention is to cause conflict and confusion. So someone who's going yeah. through circumstances in their own workforce, they don't have the peace of mind maybe to just work in peace. And instead they're being disrupted constantly by seemingly a co-worker who just wants to create havoc in their workplace. The, the question becomes though, why are they envious? What is it that they're envious of? Are they envious of position, uh, money? Uh, because uh, they see that Christians are, are good workers, don't lie, don't steal, uh, and they realize their own sin in their life. I mean, why are they envious? And that's what I don't know about the, the question. Okay, maybe the viewer who's watching, they could uh, give us a little bit more of an insight and we'll, uh, we'll ask Dr. Grady. This one, next one's from Linda to say, greetings, Dr. Grady and Cyrus. How can the body be resurrected when it has been in the earth for thousands of years? There may be nothing left. We look at it that way, but God doesn't. You know, God knows where every atom in the universe is. And even though the body decays, uh, remember, he has the original blueprint. So he can remake it or he can regather it. But whichever way it works, he'll do it. This next one here is from Les to say, I was recently looking at Cincinnati on a live cam. I noticed a building with Cyrus One in large lettering on it. I guess you have no connection to that building. Well, it's funny you say that, Les. Cincinnati Council did contact me and asked to put my name on their building, which I granted yes. So that's probably why you saw that. <laughs> I'm joking. They did it really. <laughs> He's just asking Grady. But Cyrus you know, is always number know about one. Building? <laughs> Cyrus is always number one, though. That's the. <laughs> Very good. So there's a building called uh, Cyrus just... One. Do you know anything about it, Grady, in Cincinnati? No one's contacted well, me I... yet. <laughs> <laughs> I drove through Cincinnati just three weeks ago. Uh, I didn't happen to notice that particular building. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Wish I had. Maybe I'll go there one but day no, and I'll take a selfie. <laughs> uh, you should do that, yeah. But that's about 800 miles from me, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. There you go, Les. Sorry we don't know more about that. This next one's from uh, Yuri again. Um, Hi again. 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5 says to deliver such at one a believer who sins unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Please, can you explain this verse? How can the devil be part of salvation? Well, I would point out to you that Satan cannot do anything to a believer unless God allows it. And I would point out Job, for instance, who was the example of a perfect human believer, except for the one big sin that he had in his life, which was self-righteousness. Uh, however, God is perfectly capable of allowing Satan to do things to us. Again, I give you the illustration of Job. In the case of Job, it was not for punishment. It was not for chastisement. It was because he was giving a witness to Christian believers, to anyone who believes in the one true God, of what a faithful believer is capable of doing. However, Satan can also uh, be used by God in chastisement and correction of us to point out to us our own you know, failings, and we can then deal with them. You know, you will never do anything to correct a fault in yourself until the Holy Spirit has pointed it out to you or in, until you realize it's an offense to God and you don't want to do that. And so God can use Satan to correct us in his own way. Great. If I asked you, what is an inspirational scripture that can just give some of our viewers some light if they're going through a darkness? What inspirational scripture could you share with our viewers tonight? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, we were having a little glitch when you were asking the question. No problem. Did you hear but that? You okay. know, the, but, but the inspirational verses, and I might pick some quite different than others, but I'm particularly intrigued by verses that are in John chapter 14, John chapter 15. God says through Jesus speaking five times, 
that if we will obey his laws, his ordinance, his commandments, he and the Father will come and they will make their abode. They will abide with us. They will disclose themselves to us. And I find that rather inspirational. Paul's written in to say, it says Jesus in the vine and we are in the we are the branches. Jesus was Jewish. Does that mean that we are also Jews also, although we are Gentiles, we have accepted Jesus, so we are so we are adopted and accepted as children of God. One Jesus, one Lord, one God and Father of all. What do you think? First of all, we are not Jews. But Paul writes and he says, don't despise those that are because we have been grafted in, meaning that the Old Testament is a foundation for those of us who are New Testament believers. And so we're not to despise the root. We're not to despise the vine that we were grafted into. We are to respect them. We're to love them. We're to share Christ with them. Because if they don't know Christ, they're not going to go to heaven. But we're not to despise them in any way. We're to love them and respect them. And our religion is a Judeo-Christian religion where, where we are no longer under the sacrificial law of the Old Testament. We have one high priest, one sacrifice, sacrifice once for all. We no longer need a continuing sacrifice. And the sacrifice of Jesus takes care of the sins of the past, the present, and the future, which Judaism cannot do. And so we're different, but that is our foundation, is in the Old Testament, the revelation in the New. This one's saying, uh, who are the angels spoken about in Jude 1, 6? who are locked away until the day of judgment. Are there demons if they are locked away? Who are the demons who are contending within our Christian life? If we put the Old Testament, New Testament together to get the answer to that question, there's every reason to believe that in the New Testament it's talking about the particularly wicked demonic spirits uh, the, of the angels that fell with Satan. We're in a department of the underworld called Tartarus. And the Tartarus is reserved specifically for those who were so wicked, so evil, that they were imprisoned already. This next one here is from Martin. Martin saying, greetings in the name of Jesus and thank you both for this program. I have learned a lot watching this program. My question is, why was ancient book of Jasia omitted from the Old Testament. Most people who have read it seem to appreciate it and that it connects many dots in an understanding the Old Testament, especially the on the story of Abraham. And that's from Martin. This book is not what we call a canon book. It does not meet the standards to be a book of the Bible. Uh, it is not recognized as God breathed. It is not recognized as actually uh, bringing us God's revelation and truth. Uh, these are books that grouped around things like the Apocrypha, the Pseudo-Epigraphica books, where there could even be some truth in them, but they're not God-breathed. And so we reject them as being canonical or a part of the canon, part of the Bible. Uh, remember that the books of the Apocrypha were included even in the King James Bible, but they were included in the Old Testament for the, by the Jews, not because they were considered the Word of God. They were simply considered books of wisdom that had some benefit, but they were not God-breathed, and they will not bring people to salvation. Our winner is written in to say hi to you both. When the flood in Noah's time took place, was the whole world flooded or just in one area? That's Alwyn in South Wales. Noah's flood is global. It is not local. And for example, in Genesis, when we take a look at the story of the flood in chapters 7, 8, 9, uh, the water was at least 21 and a half, 22 feet above the highest piece of ground that existed before the flood. Now, that is not talking about Mount Everest. Mount Everest is post-flood. But the mountains that did exist before the flood were one, two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 feet high. 
but the earth, it says, was covered by water by at least uh, seven cubits, at least 21 and a half, 22 feet of water. And if you'll go to Psalm 104, verses 5 through 9. In verse 5, God sends a worldwide flood. Verse 6, he says, the water was standing above the mountains. So that is consistent with Genesis. And if you go to Second Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about the flood. He says that the earth was cataclysmically destroyed. That's a worldwide flood. That is not a local flood. Okay, this next one here is from Cynthia. The, pa the papers recently reported from the United Nations World Meteorological Organization that in the next five years, we will see temperatures exceed the more ambitious target ever seen before on records. This increases due to climate change. Could we have an opinion on this, please? What do you think? I'm a very strong global warming, global cooling, man-made climate change denier. Are you really, Grotz Gray? We never knew. You've never shared <laughs> that before on Revelation TV. We would have had no idea. And it, Cyrus is very tongue-in-cheek today. Uh, the fact of the matter is that earlier this year, we produced an hour-long production on no truth to man-made global warming, cooling, climate change, etc. Uh, I don't know exactly where that is in the process of being edited and, and being released, but we just did a new one. And I've done others before with Revelation. I have a chapter in my book that there's no truth to it whatsoever. Uh, we had just an interesting, um, I'm not sure whether you would call it a meme or not, but uh, just recently I had a picture come by me of the Statue of Liberty taken 100 years ago, and comparing it to a picture today, and the water levels at exactly the same place. Okay. You know, the, the ice caps are not melting and causing the oceans to rise. Um, remember that if icebergs break off, when they melt, they don't raise the water level. Uh, there's lots of things that we could go into where we, we can show that it's natural activity like volcanic activity that cools the earth. Uh, the earth is radiating heat all the time, more than it receives from the sun. And we're getting to these environmental terrorist type of things. There's no truth to this. It's, the environmental terrorism is just a political position, shall we say. Uh, it is not one that deals with good science. Okay, this next one here is from James. And James said, good evening, brothers. A friend of mine is having nightmares and struggling to sleep. They're not a believer. Do you have any ideas what to suggest? God bless. Can't say with knowledge because I don't, but it could easily be demonic attacks. Uh, it could also be something of a natural nature. I mean, there may be some endocrine gland problem or something like that, but uh, it is also possible Satan is quite capable of putting thoughts in every mind of every human, even believers. And of course, what really is important is what we do with those thoughts. Do we reject them? Do we say be gone? If you're a believer, yes, you can. If you're a non-believer, though, that's not so easy. Mm -hmm. So we need to counsel them. We, we need to say, would you allow us to, to help you? Because if they reject our help, that's going to be a problem. I mean, we can pray for them, certainly. Where would be a good but, starting point for James to tell his friend, for example? What should James do? Well, again, if he's a friend and if you can talk with him and say, I'd like to, to talk with you about your problem, you've shared with me that you're having these nightmares. Uh, can I share with you uh, that there is someone who can take those nightmares away? That a reliance upon Jesus Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to come into your life will then allow you to reject those thoughts and have peace. You know, the, those nightmares and so forth that you're having, that's, that's a form of dis-ease. The word dis-ease means without ease. Mm. Well, we can, we can bring ease into your life through a knowledge of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. So, you know, I want to talk with them. 
because you know Jesus talks about you, you can't simply kick the demons out and not replace them with the Holy Spirit because if you don't replace them with the Holy Spirit, then it's just going to end up being worse. Thank you, Grady. Marcus has written in asking about space exploration, and it says this. Good evening, Cyrus and Dr. Grady. My question about space exploration. With the 10th launch of sending humans to space via SpaceX Crew Dragon, it looks like we could be traveling back to the moon or even Mars in a couple of decades. What does the Bible say about the humanity leaving Earth? Will Jesus be on the one who is in fact left behind? That's from Marcus. Well, Jesus will never be left behind. God is omnipresent. So he's on Mars and he, he's in every solar system in every galaxy in the universe. Uh, but in terms of humans leaving Earth, there's no restriction to us leaving Earth in the sense of space exploration like going to the moon. I'm perfectly uh, behind doing science that makes things better for humanity. But I would point out to you that the very first reason that we are were in space and are in space is because evolutionists want to try to prove that evolution is true. In trying to prove that evolution is true, they always end up proving that evolution is false. So, of course, I'm in favor of that. Now, is there life like us anyplace else? And the answer to that is no. Uh, uh, someone 15 specifically says that, in addition to which we can take a look at the earth is the only place where there's anything made in the image of God, anything that can be saved, redeemed. Uh, Jesus Christ came here and died once for all. So space exploration is not going to find little green men living on Mars. But space exploration can benefit humanity through various inventions and discoveries that we make. But the evolution is going to be very dis every time they spend money, they simply end up disproving evolution and proving creation. Thank you, Grady. And um, we slightly lost your connection there very briefly. Like you mentioned earlier, you're going through some sort of storms in your local area. So uh, we've done amazingly well to keep the connection alive. We've got about 13 minutes of the program left. If any of our viewers have any final questions they want to ask Grady, now is the time to send them in and we'll try and see if we can get them into the program before we finish. But thank God we've got the connection still, uh, still alive there, Grady. We almost lost you. Amen. <laughs> well, you know, I might look better fuzzy. <laughs> no, and I sound better on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was something about that button. I... There you go. All right. The next one here. This one's from Dylan. He says, uh, hi, Si. I don't have a question, but I just want to say, I think you're the greatest daddy in the world. Oh, bless. <laughs> so, thank you, Dylan. And he says, hi to on my invisible uh, brothers and sisters, Dylan in Northern Ireland. Well, we love you dearly, Dylan. And it's great that you're watching us tonight. And thank you for your email. Uh, this next one here is from Anne. It says, um, who are the angels spoken about in Jude 1.6, who are locked away well, until we, the, we did that. that one. I'm sure we did, Grady. I was just testing you and you passed that test. So well done oh, to you. <laughs> the next one here is 2, th two Thessalonians uh, 2.11, King James. And this cause God shall th uh, send them strong delusion, what they believe a lie. What does this scripture mean? So 2 Thessalonians 2.11. What are your thoughts on that one, please? Well, two, it, it's basically the same thing I was talking about with Romans 1, for yeah. instance. Uh, that w when you teach people evolution, they are, and, and Paul says this. I mean, I'm quoting Paul. He says, evolution is a lie. And that people who believe in evolution they reject God, they're atheists and maybe agnostics, that in rejecting God's laws, his rules, his roles, his standards of conduct, and then what happens? They believe a lie and they reject the creator, believe a lie, and as a consequence of that, you have an entire litany, an entire list in Romans chapter 1 to almost the end of the chapter. Uh, of the things that will happen when people believe in evolution. And those are strong delusions. It is a strong delusion to think that there you can commit all of these various sins without consequences. 
And so if they reject God, they're going to have strong delusion, and they will ultimately they condemn themselves. This next one here, it says, after some disciples took offense at what Jesus had said, then walked away, why did Jesus ask the 12 disciples if they wanted to go too? Well, he was simply testing them. I mean, they, they were human. They had free will. Uh, we can't put ourselves in their place, but they were not uh, robots that God sent to follow Jesus uh, without any consequence of their own decision-making. They followed because they wanted to. They had free will. And so he's simply saying, and what about you guys? And they say, why would we do that? I mean, you are the source. You have the words of life. And they stayed. This next one here said, I wonder who would, have give, who would have been with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Would it have been God the Father or Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Would God have t then taken on a form as he is spirit? Hope this makes sense. Well, in one sense it does. Uh, first of all, remember there's no other humans. There's only Adam and Eve, the only humans. However, uh, they were able to walk and talk with God. God was able to talk with them initially, first with Adam, and then later with both of them. Um, and he leaves them alone for a while, Satan deceives them, and God comes back and talks with them again, correct? Yep. Now, as far as, far as we know, this is what's referred to as a theophany. Uh, it is appearance of Jesus Christ prior to the incarnation 2,000 years ago. Uh, in the Old Testament, sometimes also called the angel of the Lord. Um, but but it appears to be a pre-incarnate Christ walking in the garden, so forth, because the Father is in heaven. Uh, the Holy Spirit, who is, of course, everywhere, but the Son can be in one place at one time. And so just uh, as we see other theophanies in the Old Testament, is every reason to believe that this is a pre-incarnate Christ who is talking to Adam. Uh, he's the one who goes out in the garden, and it says God planted the garden. Well, Jesus in a human body form could plant a garden. We briefly just lost your connection there, Grady. Um, I think we're going to take a little bit of a break to get the connection back. We're going to call you back right now. But in the meantime, we want to remind our viewers that Revelation TV is on free view. And we're going to show you this promo in a second. And in the meantime, we're going to get that connection back with Dr. Grady. Here it is. But only as part... Now is the time for Revelation. There you go. We're so excited to be on Freeview. Maybe you're not watching us or maybe you've got some friends and you want to tell them to watch Revelation TV or they can watch on Freeview. It's free to wear, just channel 281. It's available on most of the UK households. Grady, I think we've got you back now and we oh, have yes. got you back. Excellent. Grady, we've got some more questions here. Marcus has written in to say, uh, Dear Dr. Grady, thank you for answering my previous question, but I did want to ask you about something you mentioned earlier about us all having free will. Did Judas have free will or was he only born to betray Jesus like Pharaoh uh, was born for God uh, to show his power? That's from Marcus. Well, absolutely he had free will. Uh, he chose to be a thief. He chose to deny Jesus. He chose to sell himself out for 30 pieces of silver. And while he regretted it, I don't think that uh, he truly repented of it either. So uh, he was exercising free will. Now, remember, we have total free will. That does not negate that God knows ahead of time what we will do, but he doesn't make us do it, and he stays out of any influence of it. We choose it for ourselves. Okay, this next one's from Penny to say, Dear Cyrus and Dr. Grady, I have so many questions about prayer. The main one is this. 
Can we really change that what God does by praying and influencing him to change our circumstances or to help others that we are praying for? Someone asked the late Dr. Charles Stanley this question and his answer was that God knows exactly what he is going to do. Nothing we say to him can ever change that. Please can Dr. Grady give me his opinion on how prayer influences what God does? Many blessings from Penny. Good question, Penny. Well, for one thing, I'm not so sure that we change his mind as much as it actually helps us in our reliance upon him. If you think about it, prayer is part of our relationship with him, our fellowship with him. Yeah. And so actually prayer helps to strengthen us, mm -hmm. not to necessarily change God's mind. Very interesting. And so, yes, he may know ahead of time, but we, we need to pray. And therefore, we acknowledge who he is and that when good things happen, it's from him, as well as knowing the things that we should not do, preventing bad things from happening to us as well. Talking about prayer, Dr. Grady, Leslie's written in to say, Si, I know this is Q&A show, but I have a prayer request, please. The mother of someone very close to me had an accident at home yesterday, apparently banging her head. She is in hospital at the moment. I would like to ask my fellow believers watching the show to pray for her to have a fast and complete recovery, that she has no health problems as an issue of this incident and that she returns home as soon as possible. Also, that peace of God would surround her family. Thank you. And that's from Leslie. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up this, uh, this person into your arms and you know the situation she's going through. You know the difficulties. You know she's had this accident. And, and we just pray that you will just recover her in full, full recovery mode in Jesus name and that you will also bless her family and give her entire family complete peace. And I also want to pray for every single one of our viewers right now, no matter what, what struggles you're going through, whatever darkness you're going through, whatever difficulties you're going through, that you'll have the Lord Heavenly Father with you. Be close to him. Stay strong with him. He wants to, he wants to be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Just be close to him and let him reveal himself to you today and i pray that you have peace in your heart no matter what you're going through in jesus name we pray amen okay grady we've just got not long to go this one's from les les has written in to say grady do you think that there will be any that there were any dragon dragons that um actually breathed fire if so any thoughts on how this was done please Oh, I can tell you. Uh, first of all, I developed a, a, a video with Revelation TV that we have available on that. The fact of the matter is no creature can create fire inside its body and breathe that fire out. That's not possible. However, uh, dinosaurs, which are simply the word dragon in the old version, um, were vegetarians. Genesis chapter 1, 29, 30. Therefore, they produced a lot of methane. That's a fuel. And when you produce methane uh, without oxygen in the digestive or decay process of vegetation, you also produce arsine and diphosphine gas. Now, those two gases, when they touch oxygen, self-ignite. And so the dinosaurs that are called fire-breathing or the Leviathans that are called fire-breathing yep. aren't breathing fire out. What Dr. they're doing Grady, is they're producing fire in front of their face. We are come towards the end of this program. Well done for getting that answer in just in at the end. Dr. Grady McMurtry, thank you so much indeed for joining us. And I really want to encourage our viewers to check out the website, creationworldview.org. Dr. Grady, thank you so much and take care, brother. We'll see you next time. And we'll thank see you. you next time also to all our viewers. Thank you so much for your emails. I saw the prayer request from uh, Sarah about your daughter and we're praying for your daughter's full recovery in Jesus' name. Thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, God bless, bye-bye.